Yeah. Bonjour. Afternoon. Uh, very happy to welcome you for this uh, session where we're going to analyze the evolution of relationship between the US and China, the position of Europe in this context, and uh, and then we'll talk about France, quick word about France, what uh, are the evolution of the strategic policy in this, uh, within this context. Um, so I will do a short introduction before giving the floor to each one. Each one. So for about 20 years now, following the and three of uh, chi admission of China into the World Trade Organization, WTO, where there is a competition for world leadership between China and the US, even more so that since the arrival of President Xi Jinping, he said publicly that his dream was to have a, to make China the first power of the world before 2049. I am, uh, I follow closely the evolution of Chinese policy. And when he said that, he said 2049, and I heard 2030, because I think uh, he would, uh, President Xi Jinping would like China to be the first power of the world under his leadership. So competition is uh, accelerating. You know, this is a topic that is studied by the US geostrategies, difference of organization of geostrategy in the US versus Europe, to about five thousand geostrategists in the US, but who work in a public or academic think tanks, and all their production is actually public. So the uh, competition between China and the US is now the obsession of those people who, who go from the institution to the think tank and vice versa. Of course, there was the publication in 2017 of a work from the Harvard University on this conflict for the global domination, which is a conventional conflict. Uh, ever since the uh, the Athens and Sparta 25th century ago, 25 centuries ago. But in this work done by Harvard University, they analyzed the conflict for global domination out of the five in the last five centuries. And in the five la, in the last five centuries, there were 16 episodes of conflict for global domination between a rising power and a declining power, which resist the rising power. And for all those who follow the work, there has been 12 wars out of the 16. And in the four cases when there was no war, it because one of the two uh, candidates to the global supremacy, you know, kneeled down to the other. So, so in this 17th conflict for global domination, can we have, uh, uh, could there be severe uh, evolution associated with the link to the Taiwan issue? Taiwan, let's be aware of uh, it's not just the 20 million Taiwanese who are at stake. Yeah, it is, as you know, more than half of the pro production of micro, the most modern pro microprocessors is, is made in uh, a TCMC in Taiwan, and that uh, most of the global uh, foundry for microprocessors is done between Taiwan and Southern Korea, which means South Korea, that should there be a direct military conflict between China and the US, this would have a huge impact on the uh, microprocessor supply together with uh, small disturbances versus major event of such a scope. And often it is difficult to get uh, supplied in microprocessors. Now just imagine what would happen in such a case. So what does Europe do? In, uh, do, do, we, do we have a, com a commissioner, um, uh, Mr. Breton, who tries to do his best but with a limited budget, but we don't see any major European strategics. Uh, uh, so we, they in, we know Europe reacts, invests in, in the foundry of microprocessors. So do they anticipate a possible conflict and the fact that we will longer have access to the Taiwan microprocessors? Those are the questions we're going to address. And um, we're fortunate enough to have a very high level uh, panel There will be a presentation from Bruno Bezarc, who was a director, a treasury director, and uh, who is now a long-term investor in uh, businesses, who is very present in China. Dina Nina Dos Santos, who from CNN, who covers all the uh, all the major political discussions at the European level and national level. 
who will talk about uh, what is going on in the U.S. Trump had uh, set uh, um, duty, uh, tax, duty uh, tax um Import duties, you know, so they want to know if they will come back uh, or correct this. They will. Uh, we are also fortunate to have with us Philippe Etienne, who is the current ambassador, French ambassador to the US, as a sound and usual experience. He was an advisor for Europe for the Prince of the Republic and who. Uh, and we'll talk about the way Europe uh, positions itself uh, in, in front of this uh, China-America duopol. So whether you're 30 year old or 60 year old, you or your kids, the next 30 years will be, uh, you know, uh, dominated by the evolution of the duopol and the way this duopol is structuring itself. So on, we'll have with us uh, Jason Furman, sorry, who is. Um, who will help us uh, question the fact uh, that to see if China or the U.S. know exactly what they're doing. Not very reassuring per se, but, uh, you know, we'll see how he feels about it. And then, of course, Sauri Katada, who will help us to, to analyze how the other Asian country react to the evolution of this duopole, especially Japan. Uh, you know, our Asian countries take stand, you know, what, uh, in view of this geostrategic uh, conflict or kind of struggle. And as a conclusion to the first presentations, Jean-Pierre Raffarin uh, will uh, mention the European position at the geostrategic level as well as the margin of maneuver of France in this context. So we have a rather rich wealthy, interesting, exciting roundtable. And let's start with no further ado with Bruno Bezard. So you were the Treasury Director, you're an investor in China. When we followed the news, we saw that uh, one of the best Chinese success with Jack Ma or translated a year ago by a challenging of its position and that of Alibaba. We also questioning ourselves about the evolution of Chinese economy, the evolution of, uh, of the way China uh, fits within world trade and uh, its role in the global in the, in the world industry. Can you give us a kind of a, an analysis of the situation of the productive domain, Chinese productive domain in the in this context of uh, potential conflict. Uh, thank you for this question. I'm not a diplomat. Diplomats is, diplomat is Philip. I'll talk about what I see in China in the economic world and not even macro economy, it's micro, micro economy because the Cate Group invests in France, in the US and in China. What's been happening for the last few months uh, is somewhat disturbing. Um, uh, things have slowed down in China. The sanitary policy failed, has failed, and of course uncertainties because they exist in an authoritarian regime associated with political uh, deadlines of October with the Chinese Congress. The combination of the two phenomena is such that uh, it is a bit of a mess which is not usual in China, which for good or bad reasons is a highly organized country. To such a point, to such an extent that uh, economy does not function as it used to a couple of months ago, to such an extent that uh, strange uh, new phenomena, phenomenon, I hear more and more Chinese people uh, uh, express uh, uh, views that, such as criticizing the government, which is not something highly promoted in China. So things do happen, unusual things are happening in China with a lot of trust vis-à-vis, uh, -vis, uh, uh, for uh, lack of trust from uh, uh, Ch of China, uh, in China from uh, the uh, expats of major international groups and a lot of strong confidence and a, and a bit of a floating period. Having said that, do we have to draw conclusions, as I read it sometimes in the medium-term conclusion, uh, such as uh, China uh, is, draw is pulling backward, we abandoned then Saoping for Mo, and, uh, you know, uh, let's all left, you know, a, 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 a end of private sector. 
We strangle Jack Mora and all his little friends. And uh, welcome to slogans that remind us the Cultural Revolution for those of you who are old enough to remember something and reminding you of bad memories. I don't believe so. Uh, honestly, I do believe, because I live there, you know, a lot of time, you know, and I spend time with Chinese entrepreneurs, I think China will remain a, a, a very powerful economic driver in China. There is a new generation of entrepreneurs who, who are hungry, they are driven, they have energy. You know, I spend a lot of time with them, and uh, when you visit their companies, they invite you to have a tea. Well, tea ceremony, you know, there is the statue of Mao Zedong, and under the statue of Mao, at what day and now they will go public, and how much they will, how much money they will make, you know, it is a Chinese socialism. This will not change. It cannot change. Indeed, uh, there are some uh, measures against the the BATX, but what what are the measures? Well, let's look at them in details. For example to impose a right of competition in China. In China, it did not exist. You know, you could crush any competitor, as Alibaba did, the producers and the uh, sold product. The competition right, which has been, uh, uh, or legislation, which has been, we look at the text in China, is very close to that of Europe. So that's the first form of regulation nobody expected. Second regulation that has just been implemented in China may seem surprising for such a, a police, uh, police control China. The beginning of protection of private data, okay, protection against all the enemies except the state, of course, as you know, the state protects the citizens. So. The state says it doesn't have to. So beyond the, the uh, joke, okay, things are moving. And third uh, topic for those who, are, who know finance, and there may be bankers in the room. We said we Westerners, and I was uh, uh, attended several G20. We have to fight against shadow finance. What is shadow finance? Well, we allow bank massive banking activities grow without following the prudential regulations. So if China has reported the, uh, I mean, in China, this was uh, quite discussed, you know, the Fumi, the aunt, which is the gigantic uh, uh, financial subsidiary of Alibaba. It's not to annoy Mr. Jack Ma. It was just because it was a financial, a financial uh, plant which respected no rules of the rule against shadow, shadow finance that we asked for. You know, uh, over in the G we asked China to do it, and thousands of hours of discussion on this is about to be implemented. So, those refor these reforms go in the right direction, and there are, well, sometimes there are, you know, some rest of a brutal Chinese method, like prohibit the development of a company uh, once it has been. Uh, is gone public in the stock exchange, or you know, uh, uh, or s to stop a private education uh, uh, systems, for instance. So there still are things to learn. But I don't think that uh, what we read in the press, which is the clamp down on private sector, for example, that is we qu we challenge the private sector uh, to the benefit of the public companies, uh, Jurassic Park style. Of course, the language is changing. Language is changing. We're in a period where the authority of the party is reasserted in a very strong manner. But this is the very definition of China today, a very strong party which dominates, but with a private initiative which is quite high. So I think this is what will take place in the coming years. It will continue. Honestly, no matter that the gross figure is 550 or 5495, don't look at the decimal because the main figure is wrong anyway, is false. The basis is so huge. As uh, a, minister, a Chinese minister of finance reminded me, I said six five is not like five. He said yes, yes, you're right. But anyway, he says the base is such that in three years, anyway, we will create the added value of Portugal in three years, of or Greece in three years, and possibly France in four, four and a half years. So I think this economic machine is mighty powerful, and it's so China is no longer the workshop of the world where production costs would be very low. Industrialists know that production costs in China are high. We they integrate the ecological dimension, our production costs are higher, 
and China has to improve its uh, scale up its uh, range creativity of design of Chinese branch which are created, which are totally unexpected. And let me complete just by saying that, uh, well, we all made a mistake in the West. We all thought that uh, the market economy would lead, demo will lead, to dem will lead us to democracy. Well, it's wrong, which is a problem for us now. Uh, because of our expectation. I have a question, a, a tiny question. When the Communist Party, uh, when Xi Jinping personally, as we read, blocks the entrance to the, the uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, he criticized the regulators a few weeks before, and that, that can have an effect on decisions. Well, in China, it's always good to have something useful and pleasant at the same time. So there are the technical reasons that I've just explained. Jack Mann was not very respectful of the public powers, and so he makes business with pleasure in terms of timing. But I think that the main uh, reason is systemic. And in just a second, yes or no, you talked about the introduction of a protectionist law for personal data. So with the mock event, do we have a, a, a law that's being developed? Yes, that's uh, very interesting. In, when I was in China between 2010 and 2012 with uh, Ambassador Berman, and I, uh, I say hello to him, so there was the question of in, uh, intellectual property. We were going to be uh, uh, s working on um, the, the argument that uh, making copies was not a good thing, uh, that it, there was no but uh, we were told that there was no purpose doing that. The only day when China will represent, uh, will respect intellectual property, it's when it's interesting for China to do so. And now there are uh, intellectual property lessons. It, in Cathay Capital, we have a, a, a trial. There, there are legal proceedings underway against uh, a, pop, a copycat. So, and most of the trials are with Chinese groups. So they're not moving closer to a democracy, but they are copying our market economy. Yes, if it interests them. Thank you very much. Uh, Nina De Santos, uh, you're an international journalist, uh, and notably you're following what's happened in the United States. So we remember that uh, President Trump in 2018 imposed customs duties on imports from China. If I'm right, it started with steel and aluminium, but affected everybody, Europe and Canada and Mexico. And then uh, customs duties were added for up to $350 million of imports. So that was 80% of imports from China. So these uh, were maintained by Biden. And then there was a discussion with the inflation in the United States whether the customs duties shouldn't be reduced in order to reduce inflation in the United States. And there, there are two camps, two parties that oppose each other on this question. So, so there's the geostrategic conflict in the United States that has to be taken into account here. And as you said, uh, and, and we have two people from the United States uh, who will be speaking. Yes, thank you. If I can just explain what I want to say in my uh, mother tongue, and then that will balance the panel. I think uh, just going back before those tariffs, um, it's important to recognize that since about the 26th of May of this year, we now have a clear idea of what exactly the U.S. Biden administration's policy towards China is, and it hinges itself, according to Antony Blinken's speech on the 26th of May, on three sort of pillars. One of them is to invest in key industries that obviously the United States sees huge competition from China in. I'm thinking notably the semiconductor market that you mentioned in your introduction. Then, of course, there's a policy of aligning United States, US-led Western values to defend that order uh, with its partners, and then competition that is acknowledged by the United States in certain key areas. Now, what's missing, obviously, from that statement is something we haven't heard from in many years, which is obviously the subject of collaboration. Now, I suppose what we also heard from Blinken's speech back then was uh, 
for anybody who thought that there would be a big economic departure from the era of Trump policies, particularly with regard to the trade war vis-à-vis uh, -vis China, uh, they could be sorely mistaken. What we might see is more of an evolution towards a more professional and predictable form of, obviously, perhaps not imposing more tariffs, but if they are reduced, it would be done in a more sort of professional and well-signaled fashion. This week, we saw talks, obviously, with Janet Yellen and her Chinese counterpart. A lot of signaling before that. The US Treasury Secretary has made it very clear that she would like these tariffs to be reduced to ease the inf inflation burden for US citizens. Um, and then, obviously, there's members of the US administration, notably the Commerce Secretary, who still believes that these tariffs keep leverage on China. Um, there's various... Uh, issues at play, though, in the future, aren't they? Because we're about to come into the, um, the political recess time in August. Uh, the midterms are coming towards the end of the year. So I believe that this subject of tariffs is going to continue to be one that is going to be hotly debated over the next few months. Indeed, the, uh, Mr. Ambassador might have a clearer idea of exactly where Washington is going on whether or not some of those tariffs will be lifted. What does it mean for Europe? Well, at least Europe at this point doesn't have to deal with its own tariffs being imposed at the same time. So it is able to put on a joint front against China with the United States and align its economic policy to a certain extent. Moving away from the subject of tariffs, though, um, I would say that uh, it's obvious, isn't it, that we are in a more duopolistic, duopolistic world between the court between the United States and the rise of China, and Europe itself finds itself in a position, particularly in the EU, in a situation where it it's acknowledged that it doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, each country can't take the same position. Uh, but it has to align itself perhaps more with the United States. We'll probably see more of that towards the rest of the year. But when you mentioned the trap that you were talking about with regards to, for instance, um, one superpower being challenged by another and how history has fared out in that famous Harvard study, I would note that Europe, of course, can play an important role in being a third party to engineering a certain detente, if you like, on the subject of Taiwan. And when it comes to semiconductors in particular, obviously the Biden administration has put a bill on the table to help support this industry. But that again, just as I was saying, like tariffs, has been sort of kicked into the long grass. And there's concerns that if it doesn't pass uh, by the end of August, then it may not pass at all because obviously the midterms will come up in November. And then we've got a third term of Xi Jinping to contend with. So those are my thoughts on the subject. I, will you cover the uh, Congress in uh, November? Uh, I'm not, not sure. Not directly? I don't know. I've been busy with Boris Johnson's government collapse this week, <laughs> <laughs> which is equally unpredictable. Yeah. But uh, in 2024, the other thing to add as well is we might be back to square one again because uh, we may have another Trump administration who may go back to um, similar politics on China that Europe will have to contend with again. If you cover what's going on in London, uh, you will remember that uh, Johnson, when he said uh, the UK would leave uh, the European Union, he said uh, his model was to be the Hong Kong of Europe. Uh, <laughs> so it's a link with a no subject. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what's the view? I don't view? comment as a British citizen. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the view now in, in, uh, in England on? Uh, uh, on, on this duopoly, uh, US, China, and how uh, the, the UK with the AUKUS uh, yeah. uh, organization uh, should uh, insert itself in the world politics? Well, I mean, obviously, with AUKUS, it has the United Kingdom, um, and uh, that whole deal has left a big footprint here in France and French politics and French defense policy. Um, it's impossible to predict what's going to happen now because come Monday we may have a new conservative leader uh, with various different policies. Some of the people who put their hats into the ring have large military experience and aren't necessarily as hostile towards the EU as Boris Johnson was when he became a big proponent of Brexit and energized that policy. So it's impossible to predict, but generally speaking, among some of the candidates who could replace Boris Johnson, they have a strong background in defense. They are China hawks, at least two or three of them. 
so it may be that we see a more robust foreign policy from the UK after Johnson in the next chunk of the Conservative government. Okay, thank you. Uh, Philippe Etienne, uh, donc, uh, uh, Philippe Etienne, uh, you were not listening for a few minutes. Uh, you were uh, one of the one of the, the diplomats with the biggest, uh, most brilliant careers. You were a councillor to the president of the of, of France. Uh, you have a, an important position at the moment. You're an ambassador of France in Washington. So my first question, keeping in mind. Uh, the experience that you've acquired at European level, how do you see the geostrategic position of Europe in the coming years faced with this uh, uh, duopole between China and the United States? Thank you very much. I'm going to speak uh, uh, from my experience in Brussels uh, 13 years ago because that allows me to see the difference. It's true that the position of Europeans, generally speaking, the, the European Union as as players, uh, uh, geopolitical players, it's it's um, complicated. And if you read the message of Tony Blinken in May on the Chinese policy of the administration, which really perfectly sums up the situation, at least the doctrine of the administration, it's what you said. You know, it's, it's, it tells us how the United States uh, counts on Europe, uh, along with other Asian allies, in order to, you know, strengthen their leverage over China, while at the same time uh, saying that it's not an alignment. But no, that's what we understand, isn't it? So it's true that European Union uh, shares many objectives with the United States. So the European Union, since 2018, just like uh, the United States, has a, a whole uh, range of principles with respect to China. It's not just a power with uh, which you cooperate, but it's also a competitor, and the European Union has changed in what it says. What does that mean today? So we've got the war in the Ukraine at the same time, and that uh, uh, reinforces uh, geostrategic pressures on Europe. What does that really mean concretely? So faced with this situation, that is obviously difficult. Are there any? Is there any room for maneuver? What's happening in reality? What what is moving? Is Europe, the Europe is Europe seen as a geo a strategic uh, player? So let me take my experience of Brussels. I remember the debates that we had. Now I don't want to go back in time, but I need to go back in time. I need to go back uh, to the last century and the 80s, which was the start of my period in Brussels, but even, you know, during the financial crisis uh, in the Eurozone. So, so there are some clear developments. I'm going to make three observations. The first observation concerns industrial policy. So that will allow me to talk about semiconductors. The European Union equipped itself with instruments, including financial instruments, in order to support the development of European industry in the semiconductor field when the U.S. were debating about their own law in Congress. But of course, the, you know, it's also important to be consistent when you have these European policies. And the competition policies uh, were considered by industrialists as obstacles. But for the first time, it was admitted that industrial, innovative industrial projects could be carried out in European countries in compliance with European law, even if the normal competition laws would not have allowed this. So there was a, so it's a theoretical movement that was translated into law, but also a movement with a, 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 with a budget, with financing. The second factor uh, concerns the legal framework. We know that the European Union is a normative power. We can see this in the digital technology field, but this was not the case from a trade point of view. And, and this is why my memories are very specific. I remember discussions between the French representative asking the Commission why the European Union did not have a competition instrument when, not, not an anti-dumping instrument, but when there were subsidies in a competitor's country with respect to industrial products. So Europe had no instrument, unlike the United States. So so the, the, let's talk about the toolbox. Uh, 
Uh, I don't want to forget about anything. Let me look at my papers. So un under French presidency, we adopted a reciprocity policy for the European market. We'd been talking about it for 10 years. Now it's been adopted. Our f German friends and others have uh, agreed to the compromise. So it's a legal instrument with respect to reciprocity, with respect to access to the, the public market. So we're going to be having this instrument for foreign subsidies, which kind of falsify the domestic market. And then there's going to be another instrument to fight against coercive uh, measures in third countries. And we can understand what that means. So there has been a, a lot of uh, uh, trade policy developments. Some uh, might be ideological. Some will say that they are naive. We've got this toolbox, therefore, that's based on an agenda focusing on reciprocity and sovereignty. The European Union must have the means of ch making its choices. It has to have reciprocity with respect to all of its partners, and that's so that it can um, take measures uh, similar to those being taken against its own interests. So the European Union has been called on by the United States to converge. It's not as illusory under Biden as under Trump, because uh, we've solved our disputes with respect to steel and aluminium and, and industrial and aviation subsidies, at least pro provisionally. That problem has been solved. And we've created the Co Council for Trade and Technology, which allows us to compare our policies, and notably with respect to a major subject, whether the European Union is at risk between the United States and China. It's at risk of losing its autonomy, but there's also an economic risk with respect to value chains. So that means we've got to agree with the United States. So at the end of the day, for me, the role of the European Union, what can give it influence on the world scene, is in another f area. There was the panel on uh, public uh, common goods. The European Union is the guarantor, the model of efficient multilateralism that can and must be built. And the United States, just like China, at least uh, the United States under uh, Biden, not under Trump, they say that they agree with that. The European Union has m much more than, uh, it's not just an opportunity, it's about DNA. It's about, uh, uh, it's the way for the European Union to find, um, inf to be able to influence, to exer exercise influence including in the World Health Organization, so to have a efficient multilateralism based on the management of uh, world uh, common goods. If I'm not mistaken, you are, uh, you are a math teacher. Do we do enough for on microprocessors in Europe? Well, certainly not enough, no. Uh, but the uh, budgets will uh, expand in the future since I am uh, mathematics uh, expert and I'm glad that we got a Fields Medal. I think the main debate, the main challenge for Europe is to uh, align the technological and scientific capabilities and to go to an endogenous development of such technologies, which we have not been able to do so far. And this applies to all industrial sites and especially on artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Jason Furman, can you hear me? Good. So uh, the question you raised uh, when we prepared this session was uh, do, the, do the United States and China know, know uh, their real objectives uh, in this uh, competition for world leadership? So uh, I leave you to answer this question. Um, well, the brief answer is no. Um, when I was working as an economic advisor to President Obama, I felt that there were some days when we were trying to decouple from China. We didn't use exactly that word then. Um, and other days when we were pursuing an economic policy that involved much greater um, engagement with China. Uh, you saw the same thing under President Trump. You see the same thing under um, President Biden. So just to give some examples, um, you know, is the complaint that the United States has with China that the investment climate in China is too difficult for American companies? They're punished in terms of intellectual property theft, 
or antitrust rules or other regulations. Um, addressing those issues would make it easier for American companies to invest in China. It would make it more likely um, for them to locate there. Is the complaint, as it was under the Trump administration, that China isn't buying enough stuff from America? Um, we want, you know, the, the phase one agreement that the Trump administration struck in some sense was about deepening the linkage between the U.S. and Chinese economies by insisting that China buy and increase the amount it buys from um, the United States. The, um, at the same time, though, you have a strong desire um, to decouple um, from China. You see it in um, export controls. You see it in the fact that President Trump put on a set of tariffs that President Biden was against when he put them on, but still has not been capable of taking them off, even though he never wanted them there in um, the first place. You see it in just the general reduction in um, discussions or the deepening of any form of economic ties with China. I think at the root of this is um, a confusion over whether the goal of policy is a more prosperous China or a less prosperous China. Um, if you look, many things on the American wish list in terms of better intellectual property protections, um, a less of a state role in the economy, um, and the like would actually, I think, be in line with what the Chinese reformers want and be consistent with um, a more prosperous um, Chinese economy. Other things, though, um, tariffs, decoupling, and the like, um, are essentially like saying we're willing to pay a price because we'd like um, China to pay a price and we want to slow um, their growth. Now, I've dwelled on what I think is an unresolved tension in American policy vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, you see something very similar um, in Chinese policy vis-a-vis -vis not just the United States, but the world as a whole. Um, President Xi has declared his intentions to have more domestically oriented growth, to be less reliant on the global economy. Um, in some sense, that's an absolute necessity um, for China. So much of its growth was external um, that it's literally unsustainable. The global economy wouldn't be big enough to sustain the magnitude of um, external growth that China had relied on over the, um, you know, from say 2000 to 2010 or 15. So he wants less reliance on the rest of the world more self-reliance, more domestic consumption, more domestic investment, but at the same time um, pursues initiatives like Belt Road, like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and a set of conversations including with the United States that are aimed in some respects at deepening the economic relationship. So whether he's trying to create a more autonomous China or do a better job of projecting China around the world. I think some of that comes up in Belt and Road, where is the goal of Belt and Road to make money, maybe at the expense of foreign policy aims, by annoying the companies, um, the China uh, countries that China is doing business with, or is it that it's willing to pay some short-run economic cost for a longer-run um, strategic gain? Um, even that question um, is not resolved. Um, going forward, um, at least in the United States, inertia has been stronger than either one of these two poles of decoupling or greater engagement with China. Um, it just hasn't been nearly the top tier issue in the last, uh, under President Biden, that it was under President Trump. Um, it's essentially on, you know, relatively on the autopilot that it was on um, before then. And I think ultimately, though, um, the United States resolving this question, China resolving this question is going to be important. And I'll lay my cards on the table. Um, I think decoupling is um, exceedingly costly, exceedingly inefficient. I don't think the United States could even necessarily do it because Europe could 
come in and fill the vacuum. So I think inevitably you have to figure out how to make the economic relationship work, make it work on a predictable um, rules-based way and not um, suffer from the delusion that um, decoupling is a particularly feasible route forward. That just and I, I forgot to say that you are a professor at uh, Harvard University, but decoupling is actually uh, happening, especially in uh, di digital industries. The Chinese are uh, trying to develop their own uh, digital systems, uh, so the decoupling is going on, no? Oh. Uh, you're you're going to see some industries where, of course, uh, where China develops its own um, capabilities and other industries where it doesn't. In, if you look at China's reliance on the rest of the world, um, it really has decreased quite a lot over time. If you look at the Chinese trade share in its economy um, over the last 15 years, it's declined by something that's larger than the entire U.S. trade share um, in okay. its economy. But the tech industry is another place for China where I'm not sure what their goals are, um, whether their goal is economic growth by developing their own industry or uh, political control. And you see them doing a lot, taking a lot of steps to undermine their own um, digital industry, not at, to the benefit of the United States, but in, in sort of a negative sum manner. Okay. Thank you. So uh, now we'll turn to... Uh... Saori Katada, who is a, a professor at the University of uh, Southern California. And uh, as I said in the introduction, Saori, the point is how um, other countries in uh, Asia, especially Japan, but uh, the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, how do they react to this competition between the uh, United States and China for world leadership? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go it's on. a privilege to be here as a member of this distinguished panel. And I really would love to have been there, but you know, I'm here greeting from Los Angeles. So when it comes to leadership competition, it is important to think about the leadership is defined by followership. So it is critical to think about countries, especially in the region, East Asian nations, uh, how, they, how they react to the, this U.S.-China competition. For that, uh, the region is in a very different, uh, difficult position where they uh, really value both the United States and China as important partners, which feel the important need for the stability and prosperity for the region. At the same time, they worry. You know, obviously, Jason just talked about the fact that U.S. foreign policy towards the region is not only fickle, but in uh, many ways uh, inconsistent. And this is largely influenced by its domestic politics and domestic demands. On the other hand, uh, you know, China's overwhelming uh, power is worrisome because they were used, occasionally used for aggressive behavior for the, to the neighbors. So in some ways, uh, this you know, kind of a, a tension is that the you know, heavier the regional dominance of China, the stronger the East Asian nations would like to have the U.S. Uh, kind of being engaged in the region. All in all, kind of being forced or being kind of pressured to choose between them is a really difficult kind of environment for East Asia to maneuver. <clears throat> so in that context, I'd like to talk mostly about Japan in the context of the, the kind of the, the role Japan has taken in the recent past and talking about what's going on uh, currently. So as the one of the largest economy in the region, Japan has worked uh, quite hard to keep the liberal economic order of the region, uh, protecting T uh, TPP, or now it's called CPTPP, Comprehensive Progressive Agreement of Trans-Pacific Partnership, and high standard when it comes to the infrastructure investment uh, in the region. So uh, this is kind of a continues to be a, a Japan's uh, important role to play as a major uh, regional player, and especially again with the, the kind of U.S. involvement being being uncertain. Currently, CPP has already uh, came into effect with 11 members, uh, again without United States or China, while RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, 
has come into effect just this, this year, this in January, with the uh, 15 members of this uh, Western Pacific region. Uh, unfortunately, Indo India didn't join at the very end, but this is a really a comprehensive kind of coverage of the supply chain of the region, so that's, this is quite important. But I have to say, when it comes to the high standard rules, which is necessary for the 21st century economies, RCEP falls short due to the fact that the diversity of the members. So again, the competition kind of still exists when it comes to how the region shapes its, uh, its economic institution order, and Japan's role continues to be important where it's a, Japan is an intermediary, uh, it's a gatekeeper in some ways, and it's a conduit for this type of high standard rules. Now what's happening is quite exciting and, and worrisome in some ways. You know, currently China, Taiwan, and various other countries, in, uh, China, Taiwan, have applied to join the CPTPP, the kind of negotiations ongoing. Other countries like South Korea and, and Thailand, so on and so forth, have showed interest in joining. Meanwhile, the United States have announced this Indo-Pacific Economic Framework with uh, possibly 40 members going forward with uh, four uh, pillars of connected, resilient, and clean and fair economy in the region. Well, obviously, the criticism is abundant about the, this IPEF, uh, where there's no market access uh, provisions for the United States to open its market. But at the same time, one would say that it actually showed the commitment on the part of U.S. and worry that U.S. has about the credibility it has in the eyes of these followers in the East Asian region. And another thing that is, I think it's a kind of a negotiation with many East Asian nations, that U.S. is showing the willingness to listen. I guess Biden administration, I have to say, is showing the willingness to listen. So the negotiation will kind of move forward with these members, and we will see what will happen. But I just you know it suffices to say that regional uh, competition in terms of uh, defining order is important, uh, regional order is important. Where This is where the Europe comes in. You know, Japan is a key kind of a connector between the Indo-Pacific and Europe. Japan has a free trade agreement, or it's called Economic Partnership Agreement, with the UK as well as the European Union. And I'm very happy to see a lot of interest coming from Europe on the open and free Indo-Pacific. Uh, you know, Europe is now kind of getting engaged, and hopefully this will be a way for uh, maintaining this, kind of protecting this rule-based order in this region okay. and in the world, as well as enforcing many of these rules uh, for the economies around the world. Yeah, so you know, there is kind of speculation that Europe might be interested in joining, at least negotiating uh, kind of a part of the CPTPP, or other ways of engaging in the infrastructure development, Sa Saori, the digital uh, economy, and so on and so forth. Saori, do so you finally, I'd like to conclude with me? one note. Actually, this is a sad note of talking about the passing of the Prime Minister Abe, well, former Prime Minister Abe in Japan in a few days, a few days yeah. ago. You know, Japan has had a lot of challenges in, in the past, in the, in the in current environment, but uh, public safety was not one of them. And it is really sad and shocking to see that's been proven wrong and there is no kind of a safe space for uh, that kind of environment. Uh, you know, regardless of any political leaning or beliefs, so this type of senseless violence has to be and should uh, continue to be universally condemned. So I would like to stop here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, I just uh, say that we have been shocked here in Europe also by uh, the assassination of the former prime minister since uh, we also consider uh, Japan as a country of uh, stability. Dans le contexte général qu'on vient d'évoquer, il y a une dimension. In the general context that we've uh, talked about, there is a dimension that we haven't treated, the military strategic uh, aspect. What is Europe doing uh, faced with a conflict between uh, China and the United States, a conflict that might become more violent? Jean-Pierre Raffarin, everybody knows uh, that he was prime minister for th over three years and that he had uh, supreme responsibilities on this subject. So, yes, hello, everybody. I'm sorry, I'm wearing a tie. I'm the only one. Well, not quite the only one. I saw that all of the uh, service people had a tie. So I'm wearing a tie just like uh, our waiters. So I come from, you know, the, the lower levels of the population. So 
The, what we're seeing in the United States and China, is it a, just one relationship or it is the relationship that structures all of them? That seems to be the question for me. And I'm not as optimistic as what you've heard up until now, because I believe that it's the structured relationship and for which there are tensions in the world. Because as we heard earlier on, for the decades ahead of us, we're going to have this domination, this world governance dominated by China and the United States. So from a military point of view, we'll see what this means. Well, with this tension at a given point in time, as we heard from our Japanese colleague, the problem is not so much that of leadership, but of followership. In other words, it's not the, a problem linked to the leader. It's the problem of those who have to follow. You, the, you've got the allies and the aligned. And we're seeing that with the United States and China, both are committed to a mechanical movement where they're looking for followers. When Biden comes to us, he asks us during the G20, he goes around Europe and he's basically asking us to follow the United States against China. And China, with Russia uh, and the BRICS, they uh, celebrate the end of the West. Why are these two leaders trying to have followers? And our question is, can we escape that destiny, being a follower? That's the real fundamental question. That's why, from a military point of view, things are quite serious. And that's where the Ukraine crisis becomes very serious. Because in this world that is becoming a G2 world, we've got the feeling that, the, that China and the United States are governing everything. There were other powers. Uh, the war in the Ukraine is is um, undermining that of Russia, that of Europe, and that of Africa. Little by little, all of these different poles are being uh, becoming more fragile. All, all of the poles that could have helped, and so defence. The more European people are afraid, the more they are calling on help from the United States. And if you look at the map of Europe, Finland. So Finlandization, so we're seeing Poland, they're asking to be part of NATO, they're asking to be closer to the West, and the further away we are going, a few months ago, we were saying that uh, NATO was brain dead, but we're seeing well enough today that we're not afraid of a bomb in Paris, but in Germany they're beginning to be afraid. And then what are they doing? They're asking the United States for help. And the question for us today is, can we have a big European project if the people of the east of Europe ha live with fear? We had 75, we had Helsinki, we had peace prospects, and today people in the east of Europe are afraid of war. They want NATO. And why are we seeing this war? Well, it's because NATO is uh, close to Russia. We're in a cycle. Today, we are followers. And uh, the, 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 and it, the, the thing is, is getting away with itself. So how – now, I've noted the messages of hope, uh, Ambassador. But at the same time, I don't think that globally we can have an ambitious European perspective if European countries prefer American defense to that of Europe. So we're seeing quite well that this military question, taking into account the Chinese power and this race, you know, the, the American budget is one third of the world budget. The Chinese budget is one third of the American budget. And we can see that with Russia, India uh, is making considerable efforts. And if we don't have Europe, you know, we're, we're moving out of history. If there's no Europe, um, think about this military pressure. It's terrible. So what are the prospects if we want to uh, keep hold of our positive attitude? So what about the Franco-German relationship? That is a real strength. One of the best subjects that I saw in foreign politics, uh, as seen by Macron, was that we had to have bilateral meetings between France and China. He received uh, the president in his office with Merkel and, and Juncker. So it, 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 it's about France and Germany. So in our power struggle, we need this. We need this relationship. This doesn't mean to say that we throw away the others. It's very good that we help Ukraine, that we help Italy. But we do need to have a common position when it comes to China. 
And one of the areas where we're making headway is uh, this German position, this French position that are moving closer when it comes to China. So you've got the systemic rival on one hand and the industrial partner on the other. And we're in this situation where with the, we can move forward with Germans, with the Germans uh, and this pastor. Yes, I've got a train to catch, sorry. So uh, nonverbal communication is better than verbal communication. Anyway, the second subject that is very important, there's a second subject where we can find strength in Europe, and it concerns the climate. And from my point of view, it's what I refer to as planetization. People are afraid of globalization. The new form of globalization is planetization. What is planetization? It's the taking into account of the defense of humanity. That humanization of globalization is something that is possible with the young people from across the world who today are supporting the planet in order to save humanity. So whether they're in Shanghai, Bangalore, San Francisco, they all support humanity. They all managed to support that cause. Civil society could move towards a worldwide consensus. We can't have any consistency if we don't consistent if we don't have any processes. And this kind of process is good for Europe. If Europe could be a model uh, with this uh, Franco-German relationship. And there's a last point that seems to me to be very important today, and that is what's going to happen in China. I agree with uh, Bruno Bezan what he said earlier on, but there is something happening. At the end of the day, Xi Jinping has behaved as a Western leader more than a nation leader, with Chen Xiaoping. Uh, you know, moving forward silently. The good uh, Chinese general is the one who wins the war without having to wage it. He wins because the adversary is afraid of attacking him. And um, um, what uh, mistake can be made? Well, uh, well, the Xi Jinping frightened Europe. The Silk Route mobilization, the West was afraid. Trump triggered a battle, uh, a trade battle. And then the, there was the Olympic Games. Many young Chinese people, they say, well, it, it's not just that. We want to move forward. We want to go across the river without making any noise. We want to move forward. And that's what they want to do. We mustn't doubt that. But they want to move forward without a war. Now, Xi Jinping has shown a certain determination, and that has frightened the West. And that's a mistake to make the enemy frightened. So there are a certain number of factors that need to lead us to uh, a logic based on um, a, a, a power struggle. So we're seeing powers returning. Look at all the author authoritarian regimes. Uh, democracy has to face this. To do this, we, it needs to make progress. You can't reunite uh, without thinking about that, democracies need higher performance. You know, we've got the yellow vests, so we've got the capital that gives us an example of inefficacy in the world. So we need to find the right strength in order to resist and not be closed in in the, this battle that follows the United States, the world following China. If we want to have something consistent, it's time to move forward with Europe. It's time uh, to make the Franco-German relationship uh, strong and help us when it comes to subjects that where we are the most credible in the world. We've got a great treasure in our heart. Unlike many others, we have got over the horror. We've got over war. We wanted peace, and neither the Chinese nor the Americans managed to get over that. And that's what we have. That's our inner force. Uh, we have peace professionals. We are peace professionals. Thank you very much for that uh, very um, passionate message. So we have just a couple of seconds. So I just have a, a question. I'll just take a question from the room. Just. Uh, so there's a question about the carbon market. The Chinese and the Americans, are they making any headway in that field with a carbon tax? I'm not a specialist of the carbon market, but what I can say is that China takes the question of the environment very uh, seriously after having ignored it for many years. OK. Well, since everybody is moving, we'll stop there. So the, uh, it's a planetized mar uh, carbon market, but we'll keep that for another few.